Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're able to join us today at Germantown Christian Center. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis, and as I said, this is Germantown Christian Center. We're going to enjoy ourselves today. We're going to minister the word to you. And, and I say that because, you know, it's a joy and a pleasure to receive something that God is sending our way. He's got something to say to you today, and, you know, we're not going to flatter ourselves in saying that it's because of us, it's because of Him. But I believe He's going to use this time together to speak into your heart and give you some encouragement and some instruction of what He wants you to be able to do this day and this week in Jesus' name. Um, there's so much this world has to, that, that, that we're having to confront on a daily basis. And I know there's a lot of uh, turmoil going around, but, but folks, let me just tell you something. Right? We live in the United States of America. If you're, if you're living in this country, we've got people that watch us overseas, and, and we thank you and welcome you as well. But for those of us living in the United States, this is the, the holiday we celebrate the 4th of July. Uh, we celebrate the signing of our Declaration of Independence. And it was a declaration that was signed by 56 signees or men that signed this that knew that when they did, they were putting them, their lives on the line, putting it at risk. They knew that they would be subject to arrest or even worse. And yet they did so because they believed that what God was doing and wanting to create in a nation was special, was ordained, and was vital. And I believe it still is. And so that's why I encourage you, continue to pray for this great nation. Pray for the United States of America. Because we are a, a light unto this world. There is so much ministry that takes place out of this country. So much that is sent and dispatched to the, to the four corners of, the, say, of this world. That I believe God has his hand on this nation and has greater things for this nation. Because there are believers who are calling upon him. Bending their knee and confessing with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, um, we're going to spend some time today in the Word, and we ask you to turn open to 1 Peter chapter 4 and the 10th verse. Um, I think we can all understand that we are designed with a purpose in mind. You know, you and I go to the store to buy something uh, that is designed or particularly um, um, uh, created with a purpose in mind. For example, if you wanted to go ahead and, you know, if you wanted to have greens that you were making, you wanted to add a little bit of spice to it, what would you, what would you add to your turnip greens if you wanted a little bit of kick to it? Anybody? So Tabasco sauce maybe, some little hot sauce, you would add that in there, it would give that. So you know that that sauce is designed to give you a little bit more oomph on something. If you, if you wanted to go ahead and, 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 uh, and you needed your clothes clean in a better fashion, what would you do? You'd go and you buy a clothes washer. You want it to be dried, you buy a clothes dryer. I mean, there are things that are designed with a purpose. We would never put our dinner in a, uh, in a washing machine to cook. Tell me you wouldn't do that. The reason being is it's not designed with that purpose. The reason why a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, have frustration in their life is that they are doing things that they were not designed to do. We are designed by God with a purpose in mind. There were things that God has put inside of us to do. And yet, sadly, sometimes we adopt someone else's purpose and make it our own because we see how much fun they're having, how much success they're enjoying, but we forget the fact that God's got something just for you to do. You've got a job. You've got a role. You've got a purpose. And why would you cheat yourself by adopting someone else's? Why would you cheat yourself and shortchange God and you by letting someone else's plan to become yours? Find out what God wants you to do and go out and do it to the glory of the Father. But here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says here, Each of us should use whatever gift he's received to serve others. One translation puts it this way, and I, I like this one a little better. It says, Your purpose in life is to be who God made you to be. We can stop right there and say, You know what? That is my purpose in life, is to be who God made me to be problem a lot of us have is we believe our purpose is only to do what God wants us to do. But rather, it is actually to be who God wants us to be. And if you are who God says you are, then the things you do will be glorifying to Him. He goes on to say, your purpose in life is to be who God made you to be and to do what He designed you to do because He made you to serve others. Now, I know this, this is something that we've maybe touched on before, but, but folks, we need to embrace the fact that, that, that the long and short of it is we still need to involve our lives in the lives of others. I'm thankful that we are coming out of this pandemic 
We're coming out of the whole idea of COVID because that has done so much to separate people from people. It got to the point where you, you didn't want to be around anybody. You know, my wife, you know, before occasionally she'll, she'll cough. It has nothing to do with anything. She's done it for, you know, several years off and on. She might cough. It could be something in the air, you know, whatever. It is, and she'll cough. And I remember during COVID we were out and she coughed. And you just, all of a sudden, it was like, it was like dropping a little bit of water in a, in a Petri dish of oil. All of a sudden things just kind of dispersed apart from that. And all of a sudden I looked around and it's like everyone started moving away from my wife. They were around, you know, six feet. Now they were 12 feet because she coughed one time. They were like, ooh, maybe she's got something. See, the devil wants to separate us from each other, and the devil wants to separate us from God. He wants us to move away from the things God wants us to do. He wants us to move away from being who God says we are. He wants us to remove ourselves from fellowship, both with each other and with him. But see, I tell you right now, we already know what he's trying to do, and we're not going to let him do it, are we? The Bible tells us, greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. He tells us the benefits and the blessings there are of enjoying fellowship with him and fellowship with each other. And I encourage you today to not look at your fellow man as being an enemy or an incubus of the plague but rather as a vital, successful part of the plan God is trying to create in the nation in which we live. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And it's going to involve other people as well. He, it tells us again that, his, that your purpose and my purpose in life is to do what God wants us to do. But first to be who he wants us to be. I, I say it this way, we're all ministers. Every one of us are. Was that all that's a fancy way of saying you're a servant. Praise God. Turn, if you don't mind, if you will, to Matthew chapter 20, verse 30. Matthew 20, verse 30. Matthew 20, verse 30. I may start at the 29th verse, but anyway. You ever notice that Jesus did a lot of walking wherever he went? Well, he couldn't do flying and he couldn't do driving, so he had to walk. He used what he had to do what God called him to do. Folks, instead of complaining about what you don't have, just use what you do have. Instead of wishing that you had something different, why don't you just use what you have right now? Wouldn't it have been great if Jesus could have used an airplane to travel around doing his ministry? Wouldn't it have been great if he had a car, an automobile that he could go around and minister? But he didn't. All he had available was what was there at that time. And yet somehow, somehow, poor old God found a way to make it work. All I'm trying to tell you is right now, we can lament for the things that we don't have and wish we did, or we can just use what we do have and let God get glorified through it. Yeah. See, we'll always be in a situation where you can always think about, oh, if I only had this, if I only knew this, if I only enjoyed that. Folks, sure, you can live your life that way. I, I put it this way. You can live your life wishing. But you know what? God never gave you a wishbone and all those over 200 bones you have in your body. He just told us what? My grace is sufficient for you. And so Jesus used what he had. In this case, it was his legs. Sometimes he used a little boat to get where he was going. He was following the plan of God. Folks, be willing to use your feet or your boat or whatever God gave you to glorify the name of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 29, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving a city called Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Nothing unusual. A lot of people were following Jesus everywhere he went. Some of them followed because they trusted him. Some of them followed because he well, just did some great stuff. Some folks just followed because they wanted to see what he was going to do next. Miracles happened. Things got done. Well, let's just, you know, hey, they couldn't go to the movies. A lot of them just followed Jesus because you never knew what was going to happen. Well, it said two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, I've been on this road before. Many years ago, I've been on the road that Jesus walked, as it were, this road that came from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It's an arduous journey. It's a windy road, heavy, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of sheer cliffs down to a city of Jericho. And so, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a, a winding road, a narrow road in a lot of places. 
And here is Jesus walking in this road, and there were two men that were screaming, basically wanting help. Well, you know what, folks? We live in a city ourselves that a lot of people are needing help. I said we live in a city that a lot of people still need help. Yes. Some help is obvious, and some help's not too obvious. Some help that they need, they don't know that they need. And see, we are a blessing unto God. We're a minister unto the Father. We're supposed to be used by the Father's discretion and will to do what he wants done. Isn't that right? Well, here's Jesus doing the will of God. And as he was going down, it said these two blind men were shouting, asking for help. Now, now look at uh, verse 31, I guess. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. One, one way to put it is the crowd told them to shut up. You're inconvenient. You're bothering us. A lot of them I say, well, you're bothering the master. He doesn't have time for people like you. I got news for you. God's got time for anyone who's calling upon the name of Jesus. The crowd rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder. They wouldn't be quiet. They wouldn't be shut up. They wouldn't be marginalized. And they even yelled louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now think about this for a moment. What do you think Jesus would do? Keep on walking? You know, like Nancy Sinatra said, these boots were made for walking. No, you know what Jesus did? He used his sandals and stopped right there. And look what he did in verse, uh, verse 32. Jesus stopped and called them. He called them. Have you ever had somebody important call your name or recognize you? Tell the truth, how did it make you feel? You ever somebody recognize you in a crowd say, hey, hey, Kay. Wouldn't that just elevate your, just the way you think about yourself in that moment? Just, you know, like, wow, I got noticed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you ever talk to somebody and as you're talking to them, they're scanning the crowd to see who is, well, little, maybe a little more important than you that they could get to. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They're, you're right in front of them. They're just looking around like, who else? Who, who's noticing me? Who's looking at me? Who else can I talk to that's interesting more so than you? <laughs> I got news for you. That just That's just like, oh, great. And you know that it's being done to you. It's like, really? I've had that done to me. Anybody had it done to you before? You're like, well, that just makes you feel crummy. Well, you know what? Jesus, I love the way he elevated people in so many different ways. Jesus will elevate people naturally and spiritually. Can you imagine for a moment what it must have been like to be two people blind on the bottom ring, rung of society, so to say, and yet, lo and behold, all of a sudden, here is the master, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the very creator, as it were, of heaven and earth, God's only begotten son, look at you, acknowledge you, and bid you to come to him. I don't know about you, but I think I'd feel a whole lot better about myself at that moment, wouldn't you? It's kind of like the similar story about the gate called Beautiful over there in Acts. Peter and John were ready to walk into the temple, and all of a sudden a man was begging for alms. A man that was laying from his mother's womb, remember, looked out there, and all of a sudden he was begging, asking for, for money. And then oh, the apostle looked at him and said, look on us. Look at us. Yes. Now, we all know he was expected to receive money, but instead he got something far better, healed. He said, gold and silver have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I wonder where they got that. I wonder where those apostles might have seen that before. I'd have to say you could go right back to this, this little, little incident right here. Look on us. Try to get them to expect something. See, the problem is this. These two people expected and needed something and they were calling out for help. Sometimes you have people that even lost their expectation. They need help, but they've lost it. They, they've been disappointed so many times. They don't, they don't have the, the hope anymore. They're just kind of like hoping and praying, but you know what I mean by that. They're depressed, discouraged, down and out. And in those people, you need someone to come up to them and say, hey, look on us. To develop an expectation in their life. Try to instigate faith working in their life. 
Folks, we as a believer need to make sure that we recognize there are going to be people on different ends of the spectrum. Some people have faith. They're looking to receive. They're looking to, to be a blessing. They're looking to get something from God. They're looking to be a blessing to God. But then there's some who have already, they, they, they cast it away. They laid it aside. They've been disappointed too long for too many reasons. And maybe they're not actively pursuing and chasing after what God wants for them. But you know what? They're not down and out. They're not lost. Because in those cases, there Jesus has you and me. We can instigate that trust and that faith in their life. And just like the apostles did in Acts, look on us. Look here. God's got something for you. He does? Yes, he does. You share the word with them. By the hearing of the word, faith can come. When faith comes, you can act on it and grab a hold of the hand of God as God reaches down to them and lifts them up. Whether you be someone who is in one end of the spectrum or the other, guess what? It all works because God loves us all so very, very dearly. And in this situation, Jesus stopped and called them over and said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I know I had somebody tell me, well, I don't know. Jesus must not have been on his game that day. Can he see they're blind? Yeah, he can see they're blind. But do you understand? That doesn't automatically mean that's what they get. What do you want? How many have ever been hungry and, and, uh, and, and you were hungry, but instead of going to the, to the uh, restaurant, you ended up having to go to the hardware store? You were hungry, but you had something else you had to do. So you didn't look to buy food at the hardware store. You looked to buy your, your, you know, whatever you needed. What I'm saying is just because you have a need doesn't mean that's what you're believing for. That's what you're getting right now. These two people were given an opportunity to tell Jesus, what do you want me to do? What do you need? What are you standing for? What are you calling out for? What are you asking for mercy about? Tell me, what do you need? And look what happened. I love this. They said, what do you need? What do you want me to do? He asked. And they said, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. We want our sight. And of course, what did Jesus say? Man, I'm fresh out. I am so sorry. If you'd only hit me up yesterday, that's when I was healing people of eyesight. Right now, I'm doing ingrown toenails. You got one of them? Is that what he did? No. Look what he did. Lord, they answered, we want to see. We want our sight. And Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And notice this. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. I love that word immediately. How many of you like the word immediately? That just encourages me. Because it's, it just shows me God knows how to do things immediately. Now, I know God does do things recovering. God does do things in a process. But he also knows how to do things suddenly and immediately. Now, you ask, okay, how many of you got saved immediately? Anybody here got saved immediately? There was no waiting period. It was like, you know, like if you lived in the world and you were a bad person, you did a lot of bad things. Did God say, hey, listen, I'm sorry, but we got a five-year waiting period. You're in list. You're in queue. Now, in five years, if you're still living and not in hell, I'll come and I'll save you. Does it work that way? No. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad it's an immediate salvation? An immediate salvation. It's not always an immediate transformation, however. That takes a little bit of time. We are saved, but then we are transformed by the renewing of our minds into what God wants us to become. Inside, we're saved, but outside, well, we're still working on that, aren't we? Your attitude, sometimes things come out of your mouth, the things you do at times, the thoughts you think, that's something that we're a work in progress. But you know what? You are saved by the power of God and by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Aren't you glad? Because what did you do? Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I, for, I ask you for forgiveness. I ask you to save me. And I ask you to clean up my life in Jesus' name. And he does, doesn't he? Amen. Then you ask him to fill you with his Holy Ghost. And he does. Amen. All I'm trying to tell you is that, that you need to tell him what you want. And... It's nice to know he still knows how to do things immediately. 
Then it goes on, Jesus had compassion on touched their eyes, immediately they received their sight, and they followed him. But I like this, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but I like the fact that Jesus was willing to stop and notice somebody else. I just, I've, 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 I know I've said this to you before, but as a Christian and as ministers, we need to be in a, pro, in a, in a process where we notice other people. You know, it's different. I mean, I was raised up north, and I don't want to paint everybody with a wide paintbrush, but it's just different up north. So, you, know, you, you know what I mean? It's just different. I was raised up in the northeast, and we had certain rules that were just something that you learned. They kept telling, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact with people. Just keep your head down. Just ignore people. Even when they're driving. People, that's what people do. It, it was, if, you don't, if you don't act like you see somebody, you don't have to let them in in front of you. It's like a fancy game of chicken. So don't make eye contact. Look at them through the periphery, but never look at them. That way they're not sure if you saw them or not, even though they know that you did see them, but you're not really acting like you see them. So that if you don't act like you see them, they know you didn't see them, they're not going to cut in front of you. That way you can hug that bumper and not let them in front. I mean, it was a game. I remember we moved in. I was a little kid. I remember I waved to my neighbor across the street. We moved in. I waved to my neighbor. My neighbor looked at like, so like, surprised. I'd wave to him. It was just a different place. Down south, it's a lot different. You live down the, down here, of course, we're a little more friendly, aren't we? Well, we're supposed to be. But again, we got a lot of those northern transplants that come down here, okay? We ought to be friendly to folks, shouldn't we? We ought to notice people. I remember there used to be a guy here in the city of Memphis years ago, down there, whatever road, toward Walnut Grove down, and he would stand out in front of his house or sit out in a chair. He'd wave to people to, on this busy street. Anybody remember that guy? Yeah. I, I don't know. I think he must have passed by now. But he would wave to people. I thought, you know what? People say, oh, he's crazy. Isn't it amazing we call somebody crazy for being friendly? For doing something harmless and trying to brighten people's days? Folks, we as a believer need to understand and recognize we need to notice people. We need to be in a position of noticing what, who people are. Because why? God noticed us. God chose us. God picked us out. God said, I want you. God sent his Holy Spirit into our lives. Folks, we ought to be willing to share of that bounty with others who are yet to discover the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, what I'm saying is we need to notice, just like Jesus did, be willing to stop and take a moment to bless and minister to other people. Amen. To me, my purpose in life is to be a blessing to others. Amen. Someone wants to boil it down and say, what is your ministry? I think all of us should have a ministry of I want to be a blessing to somebody else. Otherwise, you live a selfish lifestyle. Otherwise, it's all about you. And in the grand scheme of things, you know what? That's a short-sighted way to live. It has to be what impact did we make? What did we leave behind? Because I've never seen yet a hearse with a luggage rack. Think about it. You'll get it on the way home. Okay. So, so if, it's important to follow exactly what Jesus did, but we can learn a lot about when he stopped. When he was going to do something else and he stopped. He noticed people. One of my favorite stories in the Bible for a lot of different reasons over there in Mark 5. The story with the woman with the issue of blood. I've ministered that so many times. You've heard it. But we're going to receive communion today. That's why I'm touching on some of these areas. But the woman with the issue of blood is a great story because many of you know that there was a situation where, you know, she needed healing. She had spent all of her money. She had no hope. She had no one to go to. She, had, she was desperate. Folks, you know, I think we've all been in situations of our lives we've been desperate, haven't we? Amen. You ever been so desperate you didn't know where to turn? You, 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 just, you didn't have anybody's phone number to call up? It was just you and God. This woman was there. She had a little bit of money, but she spent everything she had on doctors and physicians and medicines. And yet she ended up, and it said, grew nothing better, but rather she even got worse. How depressing is that? To spend all your money and you would, and instead of feeling any better, you actually feel worse. Of course, you know the story she came to Jesus. But what you, what you sometimes fail to realize is somebody got to Jesus first. 
You ever notice there was, there was, as it were, Jairus had gotten to Jesus first, said, I need a miracle. Remember this? And so Jesus said, well, let's go. Let's, let's, let's go heal that kid. Y'all know the story. And it was while Jesus was going that this woman came and interrupted the whole thing. And the reason why that's important is because it just shows me something. I mean, if, if I was Jairus, I'd be pretty ticked off. Take a number, lady. I got here first. I've seen people who think, excuse me, I've been saved longer than you have. I've actually known people say, well, excuse me, but I've been saved for 40 years. I know my God's going to hear my prayer. I've been saved. I've been serving God for 40. You know, God doesn't base things on what he's going to do by how long you've been saved. What number you have. If you want that kind of thing, go, go down to the DMV, okay? If you want to pick your number and stand in line, they'll be happy to accommodate you. God does not respect how many years you've been saved, how much money you've given, how many good works you performed, how many prayers you prayed. God respects faith. So this woman came in there and she had a ticket, all right, it was faith. And she said, I know that if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. That's all that, that's what motivated her. And she got there and Jesus immediately, if you notice, said, and, and, and said that she touched the hem of his garment and it said, and immediately, there's that word again, immediately, Jesus said he felt power, virtue go out of him. I love this. The reason why Jesus could, could have virtue come out of him because he was full of virtue full of power you are full of power too from the Holy Ghost I said you are full of power too and the Holy Ghost see if you don't know you've got it you're not going to be able to be a, a, a someone who's going to be able to activate their faith to release it I believe there's power in the word of God I believe there's power in the word of love I believe there's power in the word of God the Bible I believe that and I believe that when you speak the word, God said he will confirm his word with signs following. Well, you know the story here. Jairus sitting idly by, waiting for the whole thing to pass. He's like, I, I, I was here first. But you know what? Jesus was able to go ahead and help her and help him. And everybody got what they needed. See, I'll tell you right now, don't get too upset if you see God doing things in other people's lives. Don't get upset. Don't get bitter. Don't get resentful. Don't get angry. Don't let your mouth start going in places it shouldn't be going. You ought to sit there and rejoice. As long as God's still doing it, it means I've, uh, God's going to do it for me too. If God's still healing one, he's going to, hey, I, hey I, he, I, I, he's got me covered. If God's still blessing somebody, it means, I, hey, I'm, I'm here too. Why? Because God doesn't play favorites. He's not a respecter of persons. Amen? Amen? And so Jesus stopped. And so we need to be willing to let God interrupt our life the way we're wanting God to interrupt his for us. How many times in life have you been too busy to do maybe what God wanted you to do to help somebody else? I'm just asking a question. Take a little survey. Anybody ever miss God that you should have done something for somebody, but you didn't do it because for whatever reason. I mean, I, I know I have. Lord told me about it later. I mean, one time particularly, he says, well, you don't have time for me, huh? And I knew, we, and I would try to go back and the guy wasn't there. That's bad. You don't have time for me. For me. He was referring to me and it was for somebody else. God takes things like that personally. He cares about people. You talk about the love of God, you need to realize something. You're talking about something very strong, very powerful that God takes quite seriously. He loves people. I said, he loves people. Then now if I said it this way, God loves you. Oh, yes, he does. But you know what? God loves everybody. And so what I'm saying is we need to be willing to let the, the love of God be moved through us, even the area of compassion, because God may want to do something and intervene in their life supernaturally, even immediately, but you've got to notice them first. 
be willing to be arrested in your attention so that God can do a great and wonderful work in someone else's life. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 3.28 puts it this way. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later. I'll give it to you tomorrow when you have it with you now. Anybody ever tell your kid, oh, we'll do it later? I'm asking, any, any, come on, what parent has it ever said? We'll do it later. How about this one? Any parent ever said this to your kid when they ask you for something? Uh, well, maybe. I'm asking. I remember my kid many years ago. I, I said that, and I guess I just must have said it, you know, well, well maybe. And my son told me this. Well, I guess that means no. Because, see, here's what he knew. If I was going to do it, I'd have said yes. So what I say? Maybe. Maybe it and yes. What is maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. That, we shouldn't be living our lives maybe. I mean, would you like God to deal with you? Maybe. Lord, I, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus that I'm healed, whole, well, and blessed in the name of Jesus. And God says, maybe. You're like, whoa, no, 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 don't, don't maybe me. Your word says so. What I'm saying is if we know it in the word, we have the responsibility to honor the word, don't we? Okay. So it says, don't say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow, if you have it right now, if you have it in your possession. That is a way that we as a believer should, should live our lives. Be in a situation where you're willing to be used by God, have God interrupt you. And to me, communion speaks of God teaching us, showing us the value of being interrupted. Do you honestly think God didn't have better plans, better things that he wanted Jesus could be doing than dying on the cross of Calvary for us? I mean, think about it for a moment. That's not one of the things Jesus said. Man, Father, can I go die today, please, for these people you created that disobeyed you, didn't believe you, followed after the devil, listened to all the lies, and now a lot of them don't like you? I got news for you. If, you know, you could, Jesus and God and, and the Holy Ghost were doing just fine. But they looked down and said they had compassion on us. Didn't want us to be living in sin forever. Didn't want us to live a life below the estate that God had created and intended to, for us to have. Didn't want us to languish in hell. So what did he do? He said, I got a way out of this mess that they created. Jesus, here's what I need you to do. We're going to let you be born. But you got to be sinless. You got to be a lamb that I can be, basically can sacrifice their life and take and atone and make right the sins of all mankind. To do that, you're going to be basically brought by supernatural birth into a life of a virgin called Mary. That's who I got intended for this to happen with. You got to ask her, but I think she's going to say yes. And when she does, we'll, we'll, we'll do this whole thing. And he lived his life sinlessly, lived his life by the authority of God, lived his life doing exactly what God wanted, when he wanted to do it, the way he wanted it to be done then was willing to go and present his life as a lamb to be slain, to make right the sins of the world. Think about this for a moment. All of this he did willingly. And he knew he was going to do this for his life. He knew that's what he was going to do. How many of you have ever told someone you'd do something? A week, two weeks, a month, two months, three months, five months, six months in advance. And you knew you weren't going, I mean, you were like, oh yeah, I, I'll do it. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it then, no problem. And then how many of you, as the date got closer, you were dreading it more and dreading it more and dreading it more because you realized, oh my gosh, that date's coming. Yeah, I told him I'd do that. Anybody? I remember as a kid, they told me I needed a root canal. And so they set the appointment and they said, well, we can, we can actually do it now. And I remember saying, no, 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 can, can we do it later? And, and they said, well, I guess we can do it later, but, you know, when, when do you want to come? We'll, we'll make an appointment. I remember my mom made the appointment. It was going to be in a couple of days. And I thought, hallelujah, I got out of there. But you don't realize a couple of days is going to come. <laughs> 
I mean, you know, you sit there, you think, I got it postponed a couple of days. Got a reprieve. But the fact is, it's going to come. And sure enough, when it came, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And that's when my mom told me, well, I don't care what you're going to do. You're going to do it. And sure enough, there's, there's my butt sitting down to the dentist chair as he's drilling. What I'm saying is that we don't need to put things off. Because all you, all you do is delay everything. Amen? Amen? So I ask you a question. What's God trying to get you to do that you're putting off? Okay, praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, next time you're interrupted. Anybody been interrupted before? Yeah. Some of you moms know what I mean. You, you, you go... You know, to this day, my mom still calls the bathroom her office. <laughs> to this day, she still does. My dad used to say, oh, she's in her office. See, my dad had his office. He always had a home office where he worked out of as well. He had his other office, but he had a home office. And so if he's in his office, you know, mom would always say, everybody knew, you can't bother dad, he's in his office. So it didn't matter what's going on. Hey, the house could be burning. You don't bother dad. He's in his office. He's on the phone. I mean, anything. So it had to be handled by mom. And I remember one day my mom just wanted an office. So her office was the bathroom, you know. she go in there. That means you don't bother her. Folks, we all need to have a place where we can go and get alone with God too. Prayer closet, whatever. We need to get alone with God. We need to go to a place that we can be left alone, so to say. Does that make sense? But there are times we need to be willing to be interrupted. We need to be willing to let God interrupt us. And to communion to me just speaks of a life that was of willing interruptions. Jesus' life was constantly interruption after interruption after interruption. And he never lost his attitude over it. How many of you and I could say the same thing? He did. He was just like, he, where's Jesus? It was like, where's Waldo? Where's Jesus? They go, well, let's find him. Remember, he's out hidden, so we're trying to pray. And they found him. <laughs> Have your kids ever found you when you were trying to hide out from them? You're like, oh, no, they found me. <laughs> There's Jesus. He never got upset, never had his attitude suffered. He was like, yes, come on, come on, let's, let's talk. Yeah, let's pray. Would you like to pray with me? We need to handle interruptions in a godly way. Let your attitude not get the best of you, but let the Holy Ghost get the best of you. Amen. 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 Next time you're interrupted, do yourself a favor. View it as an appointment from the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Stop and ask God, Father, what do you want me to do in this situation? Amen. The other day. Something, I know this, you don't remember this, but you, many years ago, I don't know why I attributed to you, something must have happened years ago with Stephanie. But I remember, um, this was a, a week or two ago, I was leaving the house, and I left the house and actually drove down the, the road about a half a mile. And then all of a sudden, I just went like, I went, oh, and I don't have my wallet. And I thought, <sighs> and so I said, well, I got it. I had, I turned around and went back to the house. Got the wallet. And I was upset. I said, I can't believe I left my wallet. I just don't do things like that. I mean, I, you know, and, 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 but, you know, and it was, it was my wallet was not in my normal place where I put it. I have a certain thing. When I come in, I do this, 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 that. It's done. I'm, I'm just, you know, habitual in that context. But I didn't do it that time. Because I got interrupted when I came in the door and it just, you know. And all of a sudden I was upset. I can't believe I didn't. Know. And all of a sudden it somehow something must have happened. You must have told me some story. And I just thought of that, you know what, maybe that interruption was what I needed. Maybe that delayed something for me that I wasn't going to be where I was going to be at a certain time. And it was better. This is, you know, I'm not getting bent out of shape over it. Okay, Father, I'm just trusting you. I, I started my day. Father, I trust in you with all my heart. I lean on to my own understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge you and ask you to direct my path. I'm not getting bent out of shape. I left my wallet. Maybe there's a reason I needed to leave my wallet. It, uh, that's fine. I'm not going to let my attitude suffer. I'm going to worship you and thank you, and I'm going to have a great day in Jesus' name. I'm not going to let that. I'm going to count that as a blessing. Hallelujah. Count it a joy and go on to see what God has for me next. 
I don't know what story, but somehow I thought it's Stephanie Thrall. Because something she must have told something years ago, and it just struck me about maybe the you know maybe there was a reason I shouldn't have been there at that time. So whatever. In life, we need to handle things that don't go as we think planned in a godly way. Your faith will suffer because your love walk will if you don't. Amen? Amen? John Wesley used to say this, and I know you've heard the quote before, and that's why I wrote it down here again to remind us of it, but I love this quote. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, John and Charles both did, said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, by all the ways you can, and all the places you can, and all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And I like that. We as a believer ought to do all the good we can. It ought to be what motivates us in life. Lord, I want to do all the good I can for you. And that means I want to invest my life in the life of others. And how do we do it? A couple of little quick steps. I know we're, we're going to begin close here. Be available. You've heard this, the best ability is availability. I mean, that's not unique to, I mean, I didn't come up with that, okay? You've heard it, but it's true. Be available. In football, it was always that way. Everybody talked about, oh, we just, you know, we just had so-and-so. He was injured. Well, you know what? We don't. He's not available. He's sitting on the bench, but he's hurt. He's not available. Guess what? You can lament all you want to about it. He's not coming in the game. So let's get past it, and let's look at who is available. What ability do we have is based upon what's available. Don't be lamenting for what you don't have. Thank God for what you do have. Thank God for who you have. We live a life that people are so discontented over so many easily just, just banal things, which is just, it's so ungodly. Folks, be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for who you have. Amen? You know, I, 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 we get to the point where we just, we, we need to stop that. Be thankful that you have the people in your life that you do. Amen? Okay, I'll, I'll get off that. You know, just, just be available. What, what stops you from being available? Just being too consumed with you. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but it isn't all about you. Years ago, my wife and I were privileged enough to be able to go on a cruise, and we went on a cruise to Alaska. It was a godly place. I love that. Oh, my gosh. You know, I mean, it was, you know, love to go back. I mean, it's just a gorgeous place. And remember, we went on a cruise line that was, it was Princess Cruises. And my wife was so adorable. She said, I know this is God. I said, why is that, honey? Because Princess Cruises' slogan, I don't know if it still is. You know what, it, you know what their slogan was? Maybe it still is. It's all about you. <laughs> I sat there and I said, well, honey, I, I guess it is all about you. And so it was a joke she was making, but it was just, you know, she said that, you know, and her nickname is Princess. That's what, you know, it's like Princess. So it was just kind of a, a hoot thing. But, but folks, it, it really isn't all about us. It's not all about us. It's all about God. Isn't that right? You know. As we said in here, you know, Philippians 2, 4 in the Message Bible says, forget about yourself long enough that you're able to lend a helping hand to somebody else. Amen. I mean, it's just, we just need to live our lives that way. You know, that's just the way it is. If we'll do that, we'll be a blessing to somebody else. And I guess I want to tie this up in this simple way. Is that, that we're living a life around people who are constantly self-centered, overbearing, narcissistic, and all they want to do is think about their own needs. Tell the truth. How many know somebody like that in your life? Yeah. You know what, folks? Don't let that come off on you. Don't let that become who you are. Don't become disillusioned because other people, maybe even on your workplace, live that way. I've known people say, well, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. No, it isn't. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what kind of world you're living in, but it has nothing to do with, with doing unto others before they can do it unto you. That's not the golden rule. The golden rule that God has told us is that what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with everything we are. We're supposed to love God and do what he wants us to do. 
We're supposed to walk in love towards people and let God, who is our rear guard, take good care of us. We're supposed to be able to trust God and, 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 and be a blessing to the people around us. You know, one of the most beautiful things you can do is, is realize that God promotes, God elevates, God sustains, God establishes. You can do the right thing and be the right person and God can promote you even as you're helping others. The beauty of it is when God puts you somewhere, you don't have to fight and claw your way to stay there. God promotes. I said God promotes. Aren't you glad? You know, the, 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 the worst thing to do is to be somewhere that you put yourself instead of where God put you. Amen. Amen. Just remember this real, real servants don't mind being interrupted. They settled the fact long ago that their life is not their own, but they've been bought with a price. I once got someone who got upset with me because I, I said that, that, I, that, uh, that I'm a slave to God, but in a good way. Someone says they, they thought it was inappropriate. I said, well, I'm sorry, but God bought me. He paid the price of his only son, the blood of Jesus. I don't, I don't own me anymore. If I wanted to live for me and own me, well, guess what? I wouldn't have accepted Christ and I would, you know, be in a whole lot of world of hurt. But the fact is, I belong to Jesus. That means my life's not my own. That's kind of like what a slave is, isn't it? But it's in a good way. I willingly serve him and he takes good care of me. How about you? Does God take good care of you too? Like Johnny said, he woke up this morning. How many glad you woke up this morning? How many are glad that God looks at you and says, I love you, and you are highly favored? Yes. Do we have any highly favored people here today? Yes. Amen. Amen. God has a plan for us all. Yes, and I'm glad it's a good and glorious one. So take the time today. Be interrupted. Don't get so bent out of shape when things don't go necessarily the way you want them to. Seek the wisdom of God and ask God, what do you want done in this circumstance, in this situation? Be willing to go ahead and not be so impatient. Be willing to notice the people around you. You know, there may be somebody around you that needs to be noticed right now. Somebody in your life that is crying out in despair. You just haven't heard. You just don't hear it, but they are. And maybe something you can do can intervene in their life in such a glorious way. That God can do something immediately to help them. Amen? Amen. Uh, did you get anything out of this today? I'm just trying to encourage just a little bit. Just to bless you if I can. For those of you joining us on, online, I just want to say thanks again. Be a blessing to somebody today. Don't, don't, don't be so consumed with all the stuff you're going through that you forget that you're a servant. You're a minister. You're a blessing. And believe it, you should. God's got a plan for your life. He cares about you. And you reap what you sow. If we as a believer will sow these things in the lives of others, rest assured God will see to it that it comes back unto you. It'll be a blessing to you. You'll have people speak into your life, helping you, encouraging you. You know why? Because God cares about you dearly. Hallelujah. If there is something we can do for you, I hope you reach out to us. There's information on the screen of how you can do that. If you're a part of this church and ministry, then you know that we care about you and we want the best for you. Reach out. Let us know. If you would like to be a blessing to this ministry with your financial giving on the screen are some ways you can also do that. And again, we say thank you ever so much. You are a God-sent blessing. God's got a plan for your life and it's good. It's tailor-made for you. Never put it down. Hallelujah. Well, we welcome you to come back and join us again Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Time here in the United States. Hopefully that fits into your schedule. If not, you can visit us on our YouTube channel, Germantown Christian Center. Also, we'll be back here Sunday morning in person, just like we were today, 930 Sunday School, 1030 Main Worship Service, and online about 1045 here at Germantown Christian Center. Thanks again. We love you. We hope you have a blessed day. Go out and be a blessing to somebody. And remember this, Jesus is Lord. God bless you. Bye-bye now.